This video is part one of a case study or set of worked examples on electric fields. We'll be discussing how to calculate the electric field midway between two positive point charges, where the field vanishes along the line connecting the charges, and the electric field at a point which isn't on this connecting line. This last example is conceptually and technically more challenging, and in my experience, students typically struggle with it. Once we've worked all of this out, We'll finally be able to sketch the overall electric field due to the two charges. So consider two positive point charges, a 4 coulomb charge and a 1 coulomb charge separated by a distance d as shown. Now recall that if we were looking at just a single point charge then the field due to such a charge would be a so-called radial field which looks something like the following. So if we're dealing with a positive point charge field lines, the electric field lines would sort of propagate outwards in all directions, like so, as you've seen before. Recall that the electric field strength, when we're dealing with a radial field, is given by the following. So the charge creating the field divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, where r is the distance from, from the charge. I'm going to rewrite this as kq over r squared. In other words, in, in the rest of the video, I'm, I'm going to call 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught equal to k to save a bit of time. So that's, that's just a brief recap of um, a radial field. Now, our strategy to work out the electric field due to the two positive charges is going to be to work out the electric field at various points, which will then allow us to build up a picture of what the electric field overall will look like. So a good place to start is to consider what the electric field would be at the midpoint between these two charges, call it M. Now to work out the electric field at this midpoint, we're going to have to work out the electric field due to the 4 coulomb charge at point M, and then we're going to have to work out the electric field at M due to the 1 coulomb charge. And once we've done that, we simply combine those two electric fields to get a resultant electric field. And this is just like we would work out the resultant force acting on an object, right? We would just simply combine the individual forces acting on that object. And this isn't surprising that we need to do this here because the electric field, recall, is just the force that would act on a unit positive charge. I'd like you to pause the video and have a go at this by yourself. Okay, so hopefully you found out the following. The electric field due to the 4 coulomb charge at the midpoint M, let's call it E4, is simply given by 4K, okay, because capital Q is equal to 4 here, divided by R squared. And R here should just be D over 2, okay, because the midpoint is, D, is a distance D over 2 from the 4 coulomb charge. And this simplifies to 16k over d squared newtons per coulomb and remember the electric uh, electric field strength is a vector quantity so we need to specify a direction here so uh, recall that the electric field strength is tells us the force that would act on a positive unit charge and if we were to place a positive charge at m it would feel repulsion from the 4 coulomb charge. All right, so this electric field strength has a direction to the right. Now, we need to do pretty much the same thing, but for the 1 coulomb charge, so we need to work out the electric field uh, due to the 1 coulomb charge, call it E1, at the midpoint M. This time, uh, this it's going to equal K over, again, D over 2 squared, which simplifies to 4 k over d squared newtons per coulomb. Of course, this time the electric field strength should will have a direction to the left, okay? Because if we put a positive charge here, it would feel repulsion from the 1 coulomb charge to the left. All right? So, we can show this direction and the magnitude of the electric field to look something like that. All right? And to work out the overall or the resultant electric field strength at point M, okay? Call it E res for resultant we simply need to to combine the e4 and e1 now remember e4 and e1 are vectors so to make this super clear i'm just going to use vector notation here e4 add e1 so we're combining these two electric uh, field strengths 
uh, vectorially. And, and really all that means here is that we're going to have to choose a positive direction and let's let's choose the uh, let's choose the right to be the positive direction so combining these two electric field strengths means we simply have to do 16 over k d squared take away 4k over d squared okay so e1 points to the left so it's negative and the resultant of all that is simply 12k over d squared uh, newtons per coulomb and and the direction of the electric field strength here is to the right now let's consider what the field would be if we were to move to the right of the midpoint if we move slightly to the right of m we're further away from the four coulomb charge which means the electric field strength due to it would be smaller and at the same time since we're closer to the one coulomb charge the electric field strength due to the one coulomb charge will get bigger if this vector here the, the field strength due to 4 coulomb charge decreases and at the same time the, the field strength due to the 1 coulomb charge increases at some point as we keep moving to the right the magnitudes of these two field strengths will be the same and since they have opposite directions the, the resultant field strength at, at that point should be 0 so let's try to figure out where this, where this point would be Let's call the point at which the resultant field strength is 0, x. And let's call the distance from the 4 coulomb charge to this point x, y. And since the distance from the 4 coulomb charge to the 1 coulomb charge is d, the distance from x to the 1 coulomb charge will be d minus y. So I'd like you to pause the video and try and figure out what y would be in terms of d. Okay, so as I, as I mentioned, at x, this point where the resultant field strength is zero, the magnitudes of the field strengths due to the two charges should be the same. So we can write that at x, e4, the field strength at x due to the four coulomb charge should equal the, the field strength at x due to the one coulomb charge and the field strength at x due to the 4 coulomb charge well that's just 4k divided by the distance from the charge to x which is y rather y squared we need y squared and similarly this should equal k over d minus y squared here we can we can simply knock off the k's we can cancel the k's out so if we rearrange here a little bit we have y squared over d minus y squared is equal to 4. And what we can do here is simply take the square root of both sides and we get y over d minus y is equal to 2. And in case you're wondering why, why we're not looking at the negative root here, that's because y and d minus y, these are distances, so we don't need to look at the other root here. So what we find here is is that the distance y from from the four coulomb charge to x is twice as big as the distance from the one coulomb charge to x. In other words, these two distances y and d minus y are in a two to one ratio, and that implies that y is equal to two thirds of d. Now let's move on to look at a more interesting example. Let's try to figure out what the field strength would be at this point P that I've just pointed to. One of the things that makes this uh, slightly more interesting than uh, the examples we've looked at so far is that point P is not on the line that connects the two charges. Um, so what, you, what, what you're told here is that you're given the, the distance from the two charges to this point P. Um, and you're also told that these lines that connect the charges to the point P, uh, they, they meet at right angles. So as with the previous two examples, I'd like you to pause the video and to try and figure out what the, the resultant field strength would be at point P. Bear in mind that, as, a, as I've mentioned before, the field strength is a vector quantity, so you'll need to try and work out not only the magnitude, but also the direction of the field strength. 
Okay, before we launch into calculations, it's a good idea to jot on this diagram what we uh, what we know. So we know at point P, the, the field strength due to the one coulomb charge, well, that's just going to be pointing in this direction, which simply continues the, the direction of the line connecting the one coulomb charge to point P. So let's call the field strength at point P uh, due to the one coulomb charge E1 as, as before. And similarly we know that the, the field strength at P due to the four coulomb charge, well that's just going to be, a, its direction is going to be parallel to, to the line connecting the charge to point P. And of course let's call that E4. Now, because we know that the two lines that um, uh, that meet at point P are at right angles, that tells us that E1 and E4 uh, are also at right angles. Okay, so this means that the resultant field strength at point P, well, to get that, we we just need to use a bit of Pythagoras. Okay, so we are going to have to draw. We're going to combine E1 and E4, like so. Okay, this is a right angle and the resultant field strength is going to is going to lie in this direction like so so now let's try and figure out what the resultant field is so e1 well that's just given by k over the distance from p to the one coulomb charge squared so that's d over root 3 all squared which equals 3k over d squared newtons per coulomb and e4 the magnitude of e4 is going to equal 4k over root 2 over 3 d all squared which simplifies to 6k over d squared newtons per coulomb and as you as I've already drawn out here we know that the magnitude of the resultant field strength well we can figure that out just from from this right angle triangle here in other words the square of the resultant field strength is going to equal the sum of the squares of the individual field strengths and let's tidy this up a bit so we can pull out a factor of k squared over d to the power of 4 and then would be left with 9 plus 36 inside which of course simplifies to 45k squared over d squared and this implies that the magnitude of the resultant field strength is going to be root 45k over d newtons per coulomb. So that's the magnitude of the field strength at p, but of course that doesn't fully specify the field strength because we still need to cut the direction of the field strength. To do this it's helpful to call this angle here theta and if I draw in a horizontal here, dash horizontal line, this angle here will also be theta. And let's call the, the angle between um, the hypotenuse here and, and, and this side here of this triangle, let's call that phi. If you just work out the trig here, uh, what, you, what you end up with is that theta is equal to 35.264 degrees and phi is equal to 26. 565 degrees. Okay, that's all we need to establish the direction of the resultant field strength because notice that the field strength, the resultant field strength vector here, the angle that it makes with the horizontal is simply the sum of these two angles that I've just calculated, phi and theta. Okay, so if we add these two things together, we get that theta plus phi is equal to 61.8 degrees. Those of you who haven't fallen asleep uh, will have probably caught on to the fact that I made a slight mistake earlier here. This should be uh, d to the power of 4 um, and therefore this should be d squared. So roughly the resultant uh, field strength, the magnitude of it is uh, approximately 6.7k over d squared newtons 
per coulomb. Okay, so we figured out the magnitude of the, the field strength at P and also its direction. It's pointing at a direction of 61.8 degrees to the horizontal. So now that we've figured out the field strength at these uh, three different positions, this allows us to build up a picture of what the electric field overall would look like. And as they say, here's one that I drew earlier. There's a number of things I would like to draw to your attention. The first really important point is that the electric field that we're looking at here is neither radial nor uniform. Okay, so one really common misconception that I come across is that uh, students often find that fields, whether it be electric or gravitational fields, are, are either radial or, or uniform. Whereas in fact, um, in reality, fields are actually neither of those. They're much more complicated than um, a uniform or a radial field. And so this is just a nice, relatively simple example of that. If we look in the region very close or relatively close to the two charges, so somewhere around here, here or if we're very close to the one coulomb charge it's true that the field looks somewhat radial but the moment we move away from the two charges and we, we look at reg a region like you know somewhere around here you can see I think it's quite clear to see that um, we're looking at a field pattern that's quite different from a, a radial field pattern so a couple of things I just want to draw to your attention is I've got marked here the three points that we've been examining X M and P notice that X the relative absence of field lines here and that indicates that the field strength in this region here is relatively weak and in fact um, at X of course that's where the resultant field strength is zero. At M the midpoint between the two charges the field lines are, are almost horizontal they're not quite horizontal because they're not passing through the midpoint and also notice that the field lines here they're somewhat closer together than the field lines here okay so that reflects that the field strength um, at the midpoint or close to it is, is, is somewhat stronger around the factor of two stronger than the field strength at P and of course you can see here at P the field lines the direction is um, pretty much in the direction that we, we calculated previously 61.8 degrees to the horizontal if you made it to this point I'd like to thank you for your attention and patience don't forget to like the video, share it, and subscribe to the channel. If you found the questions challenging, I recommend you return to the video in the future. And hopefully with improved understanding, you'll be able to better negotiate them by yourselves. So take care, and I hope to see you soon.